morning. It's good to be in God's house this morning. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'd like to invite you to turn to Luke chapter 33 this morning. Luke chapter 33, and we're going to be looking at, uh, excuse me, chapter 23, and we're going to be looking at verses 33 through 46 this morning. You know, uh, this morning, did anybody get up early enough to see the snow flurries uh, floating around this morning? I tell you what, uh, we had, uh, I knew that wasn't going to amount to too much, but I was hoping it didn't amount to anything. It kind of reminded me of uh, a couple years ago when a bunch of us guys were on a Carpenters for Christ trip down in Alabama, and uh, my wife called me early Sunday morning, said, I don't know what to do. She said, they're forecasting like a foot of snow. What do we do? And, and so I said, well, I don't know what to tell you. I'm in Alabama. You guys are going to have to kind of make the call. And I know Gordon was kind of concerned. Uh, what are we going to do? And I guess uh, you guys end up calling church, right? And it was a good thing because by the time you would have got out of church that Sunday morning, uh, there was about a foot, 12 or 13 inches of snow. Does anybody remember that? And we were in Alabama. It was sunshine and nice weather and all that. So we were we were enjoying it while the, you guys were back here suffering for Jesus. So I was thinking about the Carpenters for Christ, and, and I didn't get to go on this trip. And, and there's been a few trips that I haven't been able to go on because of different obligations and things going on. And, you know, for a preacher, it's hard to be gone the week before Easter. And I said that last Sunday, and I got in trouble for not supposedly listening to what God had to say. But I know God told me I needed to stay this week. So that's why I'm here. We have a group of guys and gals that are gone and uh, I want you to pray for them. I want you to pray. There's about seven or eight that's gone from our church that have went down to represent uh, First Baptist Church in Boaz, Alabama. And so just be praying for them. It, it, and pray for me. It's hard knowing those guys are there and, I, and I'm not there. But God hasn't figured out a way for me to be two places at one yet, once yet. Has, has God ever allowed you to be two places at once? Uh, it just doesn't work that way. So uh, if, if he ever shows you how to do that, let me know, because I'd like to be able to find out how to do that. Well, uh, you know, I, I uh, am waiting for those guys to get back and gals, and I'm waiting to hear their stories and things, their experiences. And what I see uh, and what I've heard and what I've experienced on those Carpenters for Christ trips is everybody comes back, it's the same event, it's the same happening, the same place, but everybody has a different angle that they take on that. So in other words, somebody says, well, I, God just spoke to me here, and God did this here, and I met this friend here, and all these different things. So everybody had a different account, or has a different account. So I'm, I'm excited to hear the different accounts that they're going to come back with. And, and that made me, got me thinking about how you can have one event and see, see so many different angles uh, of how things come together. Well, today is... Palm Sunday. I talked a little bit about that last week and how it's the day that Jesus, uh, a presumed day that Jesus wrote in, that we celebrate, that he wrote in uh, on the colt of a donkey and they laid the palm branches down. Into Jerusalem he came. He was headed to the cross. And so if nothing else this whole week, what I want you to do is to realize we are thinking this week, we are praying this week, we are celebrating this week that we have a Savior that headed to Jerusalem 2,000 years ago and went to Calvary and died on the cross. And that doesn't excite anybody. You know, the truth is, we have a Savior who went to Jerusalem, he rode in on the colt of a donkey, he went to Calvary, and he died on the cross for you. How about that? He did that. So that's why we're here. In case you didn't know that, now you know. Uh, if you don't know that, you need to know, and I want you to know how you can experience that yourself, the salvation that Jesus brings. Well, uh, this is the Passion Week, uh, the week that Jesus was... And has anybody ever seen The Passion of the Christ, the movie? If you haven't seen that, you go out and buy you a copy and watch that this week, and maybe next Sunday you can amen a little bit more when you see what Jesus has done for you. Because I tell you what, it puts it into light, uh, all that he experienced, all the suffering that he went through for you. Now, when, getting back to the Carpenters for Christ, how... You know, you have these different angles that you approach the Carpenters for Christ trip, the same event, the same happening, but everybody has a different experience. I, I feel like sometimes when we come into Easter, I've heard that story a million times. I know about Jesus. I know about the cross. I know about Calvary. I know about him dying and ri raising to new life. Well, I can tell you this, that should never get old. There should never be a time when that isn't a big deal to you. So as a preacher... 
And, and Mike Thomas and I talked about this this past week, and I think maybe Eric Kurgan was involved with the conversation. You know, sometimes we think it's, I, I would hate to think that the cross of Calvary would become redundant. That we couldn't look at that and say, wow, that is amazing. So here's what my task is. My task is to bring you this account in a way that you're like, I never thought about it from that angle. Uh, you know, I've looked at the cross of Calvary, and, and so I want to take a little different angle here this morning. Now, it tells the same story. I'm not changing the truth. But maybe the ch I'm going to change a little bit the way we think about it and the way that it can help us a little bit more. Because the cross of Calvary was an event of all times. The cross of Calvary was the event that changed history forever. And, and so we're going to look at that account in James, excuse me, Luke chapter 23. And here's what I want to do. I want to look at not what happened at Calvary, but what didn't happen at Calvary. What never happened at Calvary. And maybe we can gain some insight from that. Maybe we can think about it a little bit different today. So let's all stand. We're going to read Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 33. It says, And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him, being Jesus, and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due rewards of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two, and when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you this morning with thanksgiving in our hearts. Lord, I thank you that we do have a Savior who was willing to go to the cross and die for us. Father, I thank you that we know that the story doesn't end there, but today we focus on the cross of Calvary. Lord, we know that Jesus went on and was buried in the tomb and, and was raised to new life three days later. Thank you, Jesus. We will celebrate that, your resurrection to new life next Sunday. Father, help us to remember the events of the cross. Help us to look, Lord, at what never happened at Calvary in, in new light today. Father, I pray if someone here does not know Christ as their Lord and Savior, that they would truly just repent of their sins, turn their life over to Jesus, and receive new life. Fathers, believers today, I pray that we would all be in tune with you, that we would, as Lisa said, set everything aside and, and not let the distractions of this world and the day and, and the events of this week get in the way of examining the greatest event in history. Father, we just thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his blood, the blood that washes away our sin. Father, we just thank you for all you've done. You're truly the God Almighty, the creator of heavens and earth, and you're here with us today. We pray, God that you would move in our midst today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So please be seated. So this morning I want to give you four things that never happened at Calvary. Four things that never happened at Calvary. I know you just can't wait to hear what never happened at Calvary. You're thinking, how can I look at that and focus on that and prepare a message on things that never happened? I think once I begin with this, you will understand why I took this angle. You see, the first thing that never happened at Calvary, Jesus never lost control. Jesus never lost control. It never happened. Now, we know that crucifixions were an event that happened. Crucifixions in that day was like a, you remember the old Wild West where they had the public hangings? 
and they would, they would bring people out of the jails and walk them down the road, and they would bring them to this high gallops, and they would bring them up there, and they would put the noose around their neck, and they would hang them in public. You see, that was kind of like what crucifixion was, magnified about a thousand times more. Crucifixion was the most horrible, horrific thing that could be imagined to mankind at that moment in time. But just the same way that, that at a hanging, it drew a lot of people to come and watch. It was like an event that happened and people would come. You've seen the movies, you've heard the stories about people that would gather around to watch somebody die. And maybe some bodies die, several people that would die. That's exactly what happened that day at Calvary. Calvary was an event. It was an event that happened on a cross on a hill so far away that we sing about today. You see, I understand this. there's a lot of events that happen in this world, but I can tell you the cross of Calvary was a big event that happened. It was in the perfect time. In fact, when I was thinking about the timing of Calvary, you know, the timing could not be any better. The timing was this. It was the Jewish Passover when multitudes of people were coming to Jerusalem. There were thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of pilgrims that would come in to Jerusalem for the Passover. It was the time of Passover. And so they would celebrate that, and they were required by law to serve so many uh, observances of the Jewish heritage, and one of those was Passover. It celebrated the time when Moses had the lamb, the, the blood of the lamb that was passed over, the, the death angel that passed over the houses of the Egyptian or the uh, Hebrews while they were in Egyptian bondage. So they were coming together, and the timing was perfect. There was a multitude of people that was there from every nationality, every race, every background. There was Jewish people everywhere there. It was a time in history whenever people were coming together. It was a time in history when the Romans were ruling. The Roman rule had a big part to play in the timing of this event. You see, until that very moment in time, there was not the, the uh, avenues of the event to happen in the way they did until the Romans were in rule. The Romans were ruling the world. The Romans had everything under control. They had begun to build an infrastructure, highway systems, a commerce system that linked the whole world together. In fact, before that time, it was uncommon to hear of things that would happen around the world. When the Romans took power, they had a road system, a, a, a commerce system that everybody was able to, to communicate back and forth. Now, why is that important? Well, I can tell you the truth. When the greatest event in history is going to happen, you want the word to get out. And so that timing was perfect. The Romans were in rule. Their structure was in place. The language was much spoken the same. In fact, everybody knew Greek language. It was the first time in history that all the languages, there were still multiple languages, but the, the language of the, the world at that time was, was influenced heavily by the Greek language. So people were there. The timing was right. The Jewish people, the Passover, the Roman rule that was in place, the Greek language that was spoken, and all those things came together at God's time. You see, Jesus never lost control. Everything that happened, everything that was said, everything that was done, we think that people are in power. We think that things are in place by the hands of man. I tell you the truth, the cross proves that the hand of God was completely over that event. What about the people? The people were there. The crowds had gathered. The mobs had came together. I tell you what, I believe that the people were there, and they went from crown him as king to crucify him, kill him. We don't want him. We want Barabbas. Kill Jesus. I would say there was probably about as much chaos at that time as there was as a Donald Trump rally. I tell you what, it was, it was, it was out of hand. The people turned and they began to holler and they began to scream and they began to, to say, we want Jesus not as king, now we want him crucified. How quickly an event can change. Have you ever tried to plan an event? You try to get the timing just right, you try to get the right people there, the right place, everything to be just so-so and it just doesn't happen? I can remember a time whenever I was in eighth grade. And my mom and dad's going to remember this immediately. My eighth grade birthday party. The time was right. It was my birthday. The celebration was right. It was at our house. They allowed me to invite a certain amount of guys to come over and celebrate my birthday. Sure enough, I invited four or five guys, and the word got out, and it was about 12 guys that showed up for my birthday party. 
Now, my mom, being the host she is, she went ahead and allowed that, but if she would have known what was going to happen that night, she would have cut it off right at the beginning. In fact, if you ask now, some almost, you know, 35 years later, it was a birthday party that is still remembered 35 years later. If you ask anyone in my class, anyone that was there, that was the best birthday party ever, and I'm sure my mom and dad would say that was the worst event of my life. You see, we had just the right people there, and they were there, and we were all together. Can you imagine a bunch of teenage boys? Now, not four or five. I'm talking about, about a dozen. I mean, there was all kinds of chaos that went on. I can't even begin to say what happened at that birthday party is going to stay there. It wasn't nothing horrible. It was just orneriness and meanness and things like that coming out of guys. And I know this. I remember at 3 o'clock in the morning, my dad coming out of that bedroom, and he's saying, everybody's going to go to bed, and you're all going home in the morning. The event was over he still remembers that in fact I think that's when he started losing his hair at that time I'm not sure <laughs> you see that event had been planned there was a certain way it was supposed to happen the way we wanted it to happen the way they had planned that the birthday cake was there that was got into during the night everything was ruined it didn't happen the way that that they had planned it didn't happen the way I thought it was going to happen I tell you what I thought I was going to die the next day thank God they showed me grace but the bottom line is this, we can try to orchestrate and plan events, and events sometimes don't go the way we'd plan. I can tell you the truth, Jesus had planned this. God had this plan orchestrated. The, the crucifixion was not in the hands of the Roman government. It was not in the hands of the Jewish leaders. It was not in the hands of the mob. It was not in the hands of the Greek. It was in the hands of God. What seemed to be a spontaneous, chaotic event that erupted was completely controlled by God you see Jesus was being crucified at Calvary in verse 33 it says and when they come to the place called Calvary there they crucified him and the criminals one on the right hand and one on the left you see Jesus was hanging on that cross but Jesus was still in complete control how do I know that look at verse 34 Verse 34, Jesus, while he's being nailed to the cross, the spikes going through his hands, hanging on the cross, he says these words, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I don't know about you, but I don't think I've got enough in me to even believe for one second when somebody would do that to me that I would say, forgive them. They don't understand. Jesus was in control of his thoughts. Jesus was in control of his actions. Jesus was in control of the forgiveness. Jesus was in control of his temper. How many of you, when you get into a bad situation, lose your temper? Uh-oh. I've hit some nerves there. I got some hands going up, and I didn't even ask for it. I tell you what, if you lose your temper over the silly things you probably do, I imagine if somebody nailed you to a cross, you would lose your temper. And especially when you had the power and the control to change everything, God, take them and wipe them out dead. I'm sick and tired of this. They don't appreciate me. They don't know what I've done for them. Jesus didn't say that. His thoughts were right there. Father, forgive them. You know, we talk about forgiveness a lot, and I'm not preaching that message right now, but I can tell you, if you're not forgiving someone for something they've done, I don't care how bad it is, it cannot be any worse than what Jesus forgave you. Because when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, he wasn't just talking about the Roman leaders and the Jewish leaders and all the people that were there. He was talking about you. Father, forgive them. They don't understand what they're doing. Folks, Jesus never lost control. Every emotion, every thought, every bit of him, every, all the power, even the prophecy. Do you know, now listen to this, do you know that even all of the prophetic things that had to happen at Calvary completely, perfectly happened? It was prophesied that he would be hung between two criminals. It was prophesied the things that would happen. It was prophesied all of these things came together and Jesus, the Father, and the Son were completely in control. Jesus never lost control the day of Calvary, even though the world thought that they had him right where they wanted him. The next thing that never happened at Calvary, Jesus never lost sight. Jesus never lost sight. 
Now, I just told you that Jesus was, was hanged on the cross between two criminals. It says that right here in verse 33. But the conversation that happened on those, can you imagine the conversation being nailed to a cross and two guys, one on each side of you, and the conversation that happened at that moment? It says in verse 39, look what one of them said. One of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save, your, save, us and your, and, uh, save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing that you are under the same condemnation? And we indeedly, uh, indeed justly, for we receive due rewards of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now Jesus at that moment could have went two different directions. Jesus could have done anything that he wanted to. He was still in complete control one of the guys blasphemed him. It's like this. He cursed God to his face. Now, this is a side note, and you may think it's not the same, but it's kind of the same. If you use the Lord's name in vain, you're cursing God. If you say God's name in vain or Jesus' name in vain, I tell you what, it's like that thief on the cross that cursed God that day when he cursed Jesus. There's a lot of words that I hear thrown out there, curse words, but when I hear the God of the creation of all the universe, my Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, cursed. That just, does that not turn you upside down? One blasphemy to me cursed at Jesus. If you're the Christ, if you're the Son, you get yourself down. Get us down from here. What did the other one do? Here's what he did. He did what we learn in Bible school, the ABCs. He admitted that he was a criminal. He had sin in his life. I know I had a teenage moment there. It didn't come out right. I'm still going through the change in my, yeah. He admitted that he had sin in his life. He believed that Jesus was God. And he confessed that he needed Christ in his life. How hard that is for people to do, but how easy it is to give your life to Jesus. You admit, I am a criminal. I deserve to die on the cross. We deserve what we're getting here. This man has done nothing wrong. He does not deserve to die. Jesus, remember me. Forgive me. He was turning to Christ and saying, I admit I'm a sinner. I believe that you're God's son, and I confess I need you, Jesus. And that's exactly what the whole world needs to do today. But here's what happened to Jesus. In the midst of all that, he could say, guys, I'm kind of busy. I'm dying here. You guys are on your own. It's too far gone. It's too late. You can't do anything to get your salvation. You can't. I tell you what, if, here's, a, here's a side note. If you think you can earn your way to heaven, you read this account right here and tell me how that thief earned his way to God's kingdom. If you think you can be baptized in a tank of water to save you from your sins, that thief on the cross, Jesus lied to him. Because Jesus said this in verse 43, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. He's saying, today you're going to receive God's kingdom. That man was never baptized. That man never did one good deed in his life. That man never went to church. That man never said anything. But Jesus, I need you in my life. And that's what got him to heaven. Do you need to be baptized? You sure do. After you do that... Do you need to live your right, life right for God? Yeah, after you do that, I'll bet if that thief on the cross, if Jesus said, I forgive you and I'm going to let you down, I bet you he'd have lived his life for Jesus. You know what? That cross that you should have been hanging on right there with Jesus, in Jesus' place, Jesus said, you come down and I'll save you, but I want you to live your life for me. And people say, I can't do that. That's too much. God, you really can't expect me to do that. How can you say this? How can you expect me to be in church every Sunday? Oh, my gosh. In the midst of all of the crucifixion and the pain that Jesus went through, now listen to this. Jesus never lost sight of his mission. Jesus never lost sight of his mission. What was the mission of Jesus? Well, I think it was found back in Luke chapter 19. And he says this. He said, I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. 
And folks, if that's not the mission of a church, if that's not the mission of the believers, then folks, we have lost sight of our mission. This church can never turn inward. Jesus didn't turn to himself and say, guys, I'm kind of busy dying here. I'm suffering. Can't you see? Leave me alone. Jesus turned outward and said, I have come to seek and save you. Today you will be with me in paradise, even in the midst of the crucifixion. What never happened? Jesus never lost sight of a lost sinner dying and needing forgiveness. The moment we lose sight of lost sinners dying and going to hell without Jesus is the moment that we lose the mission of Christ. Jesus never lost his sight. Next thing that Jesus never did, Jesus never lost his title. I kind of like that one. God gave me that one too, and I was thinking, you know, when he gave me that, Jesus never lost his title. Now, I can tell you today, there is always somebody going to challenge you in your title. No matter who you are, no matter what you're doing, if, whether it's in your job, in your workplace, in sports, whatever it is, somebody's always going to challenge your title. Jesus, his title was being challenged. What was the title in verse 35? The people who stood around the cross. There was hundreds of people standing around the cross. It was a public ex exhibition of, of power by the Roman authority. So they stood, stood around. Boy, they stood around. Makes me feel young when I can do that still. So the people stood around. Boy, if I could just get a pimple, I'd really feel young. I don't know where that come from. It just popped in my mind. I had to get it out. Be quiet back there, Merle. Yeah, bless my heart. Yes. Whew, it's getting hot up here. So in verse 35, look at this. It says, the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself. Now, now look at the title that's being challenged here. If he is the Christ, if he is the chosen of God, the soldier said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Do you understand the title that was being challenged at that very moment? If you're the Christ, like you say you are, you come down. If you are the chosen one of God, you come down. If you are the king of the Jews, you come down. Now, I want you to think about that here for just a minute. Just because someone tries to take away the title of Jesus will never take away the true title and authority of Christ. There's people today that say the very same thing. If he is Jesus, if he is the Christ, if he is the chosen one of God, then why isn't this happening? If you are God, if you are Christ, then make this happen. We challenge that. People try to say, if your God is so powerful, why is this happening? I can tell you the truth. God cannot change what must happen. You see, at Calvary, they took Jesus... Here's what they tried to do. They tried, a crucifixion was a public display of humility. You've got to remember that. A public display of humility. Have you ever been humiliated in your life? Have you ever been public, on public display for any reason in a negative way? I can tell you the truth. Jesus Christ, the Savior of this world, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the chosen one of God, the Christ that came, he was stripped of everything humans could strip him of. They took away his dignity. How'd they do that? They beat him half to death. They stripped his clothes off and cast lots for his garments. Jesus died naked on the cross for the whole world to see so here's what I got a problem with. This just came to my mind. If someone wants to give their life to Christ in a private way, I say, look at what Jesus did for you in a public way. There is no shame when you come to Christ. There is no secretiveness of that. He died in public humiliation for you. The least you can do is publicly declare, he is my Christ. He is my Lord. He is the King. He is the one. So there's no room for shame in your life. 
They tried to strip away his crown. They tried to strip, strip away his authority, his ability, all these things, when in reality they were just promoting the cause of Christ. Don't you find it interesting, and it doesn't say it in Luke, don't you find it interesting that the sign above his head, and just like, well, the sign out in the hallway has that inscription, I hope that it says right, Sue, because I have no idea how to read uh, all the languages. In three different languages, above his head, they put the inscription, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. In another account, it said that the Jewish people said, we don't want that sign on top of him because he's not our king. And the Romans in authority said, it is what it is. It will stay in place. You see, I somehow feel like God, in his own way, was saying, you can take away the dignity, you can humiliate my son, you can hang him on a cross, but you will never take away his rightful crown. He is the king of the Jews. He is the chosen one. He is the Christ, the king. And he died as a king. He may not have looked like a king. He may have looked like he lost all of his power and authority, but Jesus was in control. Jesus had never lost sight of seeking and saving you when he died on the cross. And Jesus was king. How about this today? Some people make Jesus king and some people don't. Just because somebody doesn't make Jesus king doesn't mean he's still not king. You know, I heard a, a, a Doug Payne, I think, say this one time, and I never thought about this. We say we need to put Jesus on the throne where he belongs. I can tell you, I can't put Jesus on the throne. I don't have that power and authority. He's already there. I just have to admit that in my life. You understand what I'm saying? Just because I don't acknowledge him as king, just because I don't honor him as king, doesn't mean he's not on his throne today. He's at the right hand of God, the Father. He never lost his title. Even when he died on the cross, he was still king. He was still Lord. He was still Christ. He was still the one that died. They tried to take away all the human dignity they could, but they could not take away his title. Do you know what happens when you get saved by the blood of Jesus? And you may face this someday. You can face ridicule. You can face persecution. They can throw you in jail. They can take away everything from you, but they cannot take away your title because the king of kings has won that. Your title is a child of the king. And nothing can ever take that away. You know, some of the hardest concentration camps during World War II, they stripped every man of their dignity, took their clothes off, gave them nothing and they tried to take away everything that they could. And the men that stood up to that and lived through that, they will say many of them were believers in Christ. And they said, you can take everything in this world away from me, but you cannot take my faith in God. Oh, how we need that kind of faith. They couldn't take his title away, and neither can you. Last thing I want you to hear today. Four things that never happened. Number one, Jesus never lost control. Jesus never lost sight of those he came to save. Jesus never lost his title. And finally, Jesus never lost the battle. Do you know in American history, there was a war that divided this country? We know that. It was called the Civil War. And how many of you are Civil War buffs? Like to study and read? There's several of you in here. It's very interesting, and it's kind of neat to go back, and, and they're trying to take away our Civil War history right now out of this country. It happened. You can't ignore it. You can't deny it. It happened. Just like they're trying to take the war that happened this day on Calvary. They're trying to take that out, say it never happened. He doesn't exist. We don't want in God we trust. You can't ignore that it happened. Well, in Civil War history, there was many battles that were fought. And I'm reminded of a time and a battlefield that I visited one time a few years ago down in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. It was just one of the very first Carpenters for Christ trips I'd went on, maybe the second or third. We went to Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and there was a battlefield there. Anybody heard of the battlefield at Murfreesboro, Tennessee? I'll bet you Gordon Sansom has. In fact, I think we've talked about it before. This battlefield was a battle of Stone River. That's where this battle took place, the battle of Stone River between the Confederates and the Union Army. And I was on a Confe Carpenters for Christ trip, 
and we had a Sunday afternoon off, and so we were going to go see some site, and we decided we was going to go to this battlefield. There was a there was a uh, information booth there, you know, welcome center, and you could go around, and it had different sites where this this battle took place, and this took place, and this took place, and there were many, 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 many soldiers that were buried there, Union and Confederate. And we went to the Union fields and battle or the uh, Union um, um, cemetery and saw all the men who had died there. And we went over to Confederate. Uh, cemetery and we saw all the men who died there and I'm thinking there was a battle that happened here do you know that there was I wrote it down there was 12,906 Union soldiers died in that battle there was 11,739 Confederate soldiers that died in that battle there were a lot of guys that died that day or that during that battle just a few day battle you know that was a major battle and a turning point in the war that was a major battle in the fact that there was a battleground there, a lot of loss of life. There was only about 75,000 men that fought there that day or that, during that time period, that short time period. I keep saying day, that time period. And there was, you know, 24,000 men who died. A third of all the men who came to fight died there that day or during that time. You know, I was thinking about that, and as we went through that battlefield, I happened to realize who I was with. I was with a lot of my buddies from, from Pleasant Hill, but there was somebody else that we'd made contact with, and he's still a, a really good friend of mine, one of my best friends, and he lives down in Alabama. He's from Louisiana. His name is K. Drew Strickland. A lot of you guys know K. Drew. He's just an easygoing guy. He's a plumber. I'm kind of worried because he, I, I've been his plumber's assistant on a lot of these trips, and I've missed the last three trips, and I'm afraid I'm going to lose my spot. Now, one of the qualifications for being a plumber's assistant is you have to know where all the local Dairy Queens are. Because we get kidded about when we go on plumbing supply runs, we always find a, an ice cream shop on the way back. You know, that's a hard job because when you get that ice cream and you go back to the job site, you've got to eat that so fast it gives you a headache on the way. It's a tough job. But K. Drew, he's from Louisiana, born in Louisiana, lives in Alabama. He's as southern as they get. And I remember walking through that battlefield, and I didn't think too much about that. But he told a story afterwards whenever we had our last night. And Kadrew said this. He said, you know, these boys from Pleasant Hill, we got quite a reputation with the Carpenters for Christ. He said, I just thought they was a bunch of Yankees. He said, I didn't like you when you showed up. Honestly, I didn't like you because you was from the north. That's it's still a serious thing for them. They, they don't think that the war's over. They think it's a long ceasefire in between. It's, and they may be right. But you know the truth of it is, he said, you guys were just, I thought you was a bunch of Yankees, and I didn't really even know if I was going to like you. He said, you guys are more redneck than we are. And we formed a bond out of that by being at that battlefield in such a way that Kadra and I, we, we love each other, we're brothers in Christ. We would do anything for one another. We spent time together. I've stayed in his home. He stayed in my home. His wife and my wife are really good friends, even though the distance is so far apart. But the battle that happened at that time was a, was a battle that was dividing a nation. Do you know the same battle that was fought the day of Calvary is the same battle that brought two men of different backgrounds together? Do you know that Cader and I can be brothers in Christ because the day of Calvary when Jesus died? Do you know there's a bond within our relationship that is stronger than any bond that a man can make? Do you realize that at Calvary, Jesus fought the battle? It was a major battle. There was only one that died. Well, there was three that died, but there was only one that really made the difference. And here's the truth, and I want you to hear this. In every battle, there is something always at stake. It's hard to go into battle if you don't think it's worth fighting. There's got to be something at stake for you to fight a battle. Now, there's battles militarily. There's battles in our lives. There's battles in our, in our communities. There's battles in our homes. There's all these different battles that go on at work. There's got to be something at stake. Do you know what was at stake that day at Calvary? You. Do you know what was at stake that day at Calvary when Jesus decided there was enough at stake he had to die? your sin do you know that day at Calvary when he decided that it was finished and he gave his life folks listen to me
there's nobody in this world that took the life of Christ. He gave his life. I want you to look at verse 40. It says, when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, in your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Jesus was in control all the way to his last breath. Jesus never lost sight all the way through the crucifixion of people needing him. Jesus never lost his title as king even though he died that day. Jesus never lost the battle. His death is victory to a believer. You know, I can't express to you how much the importance of this week is and the day we celebrate is Good Friday. When you go through your day this Friday, you're going to do all these different things, but at least think about the moment that Christ hung on the cross and what he went through and who he was thinking about and what he did for you. And if you're a believer, you need to praise God. And if you don't belong to Christ, why not give your life today to him like that thief on the cross? You don't have to wait till you're facing death to give your life to Christ. I've heard people say, you know what, preacher? I'm going to live my life this way. And at that very last moment, I'll pray to receive Christ, just like the thief on the cross. You don't know that you're going to get that moment. You don't know when that's going to happen. So the bottom line is this. Why not today? You may die like that thief on the cross that did not confess Christ, and your fate is just like his. You will die and go to hell without Christ. So let me summarize it this way. With Jesus, you will always win. What about control? Some of you have problems with control. Some of you here today feel like life is out of control. Some of you feel like you want to be in control. I can tell you the truth. There is no event, there's no time, there's no thing that you will go through. If you put it in his hands, he was in control at the cross. He can be in control of whatever you're going through. What about sight? We're getting ready to go to Easter Sunday. We have a church that God has given us, a building that God has given us, uh, an opportunity to bring more people into this church than we ever have. Just by sheer capacity, just by sheer numbers of people, if everybody here, you included, would bring one person with you, we would not have enough room in this church next Sunday. How much effort have you put into bringing people in to hear the message of the gospel? Now, I'm not chastising you because I have no idea. I passed these cards out, or I challenged you with these cards last week. This is so simple. Your Savior died on the cross for you. All I'm asking you is to take this card and find your neighbor, your friend, your enemy, your coworker, whoever it is, and say, would you come to Easter service with me next Sunday right here at First Baptist Church? Because I guarantee you the cross will be preached, the empty tomb will be preached, Jesus will be glorified, and opportunity for somebody to get saved will happen. You don't even have to know any details. It says it on the back. Here's when you need to be here. There's where you need to be. Be here. I'll come get you. I'll carry you on my back. I'll bring my moped and bring you. I don't care what you do. Just bring somebody with you. Take one of these cards. At least we can invite people to come. People are more open to come to church and hear about Jesus than you ever will be to tell them. I found that out. These cards are here at this invitation time. Todd, I want you to come, and I want you to play something for us. And Corey, just leave that up there for right now. It doesn't matter what you're struggling with in control. Somebody here today needs to give God control. You may be a believer in Christ, and you're trying to control your life. Do not try to do that. Give it to God. Whether it's the best thing that's ever happened to you, the worst thing that's ever happened to you, anything in between, put it in God's hands. He needs to be in control. Why? He controlled his destiny on the cross. He can control whatever you're going through. How about sight, church? We have to keep sight of those around us who need Christ. There's a church full of people here today, but there's a whole lost world out there that's dying beside Jesus and never confessing him as Lord. Jesus says, would you stand in the gap and ask them to come and hear about the message? He may be telling you, you just go ahead and share. You open your Bible up and you lead that person to know Christ, to know me. 
You see, Jesus is king. If Jesus is king of your life, if you've given your life to Christ, you have no fears because they can take everything from you. You may be losing something. You may be in trouble. You may be whatever it may be. You may be on top of the world, but you're not more than God. And you just need to acknowledge him. Jesus, I am not making you king. You are king, and I want you to be my king. as we begin this invitation, I'd like for a few deacons to come forward. There may be somebody here today, your battle is going on right now. Nobody sees it, nobody knows it, but there's a battle in your heart, in your mind, within yourself, and that battle is this, am I going to give in and let Jesus have his way in my life? Or am I going to hold back and say, you know what, I'm going to fight it off one more day. You're fighting a losing battle. You may die fighting that losing battle. Don't die without Jesus.